Welcome to the Insightful Professor. Today we continue our examination of exception handling in Java, and we're going to look at another variation of using the try-catch block. In this case, we're going to discuss what we would call input validation. When we consider the try-catch statement, we could say that there are two parts to the statement. One is the try block, and the other is the catch block. The try block contains an instruction or set of instructions that may execute and potentially cause some kind of an exception to be thrown, some kind of an exceptional condition. The catch block is associated with a try block and contains what we call an event handler. Should an exception be thrown when we execute the code within a try block, the associated catch block is intended to deal with that situation in some way. It's going to catch the exception that has been thrown and respond to it in some way. There could be more than one way to design a try-catch statement to deal with or respond to some exception. So the code in the catch block could, in one situation, say, handle the condition and then simply terminate the program. Typically, the way we would terminate a program is by making a call to the exit method associated with the system object. And this would effectively just say, end the program. But we, we send back a return code. If we put a value of zero in here, that typically is intended to signify that everything went OK. So in response to an exception being thrown and the program not being able to deal with that exception, we wouldn't want to say, hey, things worked out OK. But what we would like to do is signal some, some way that indicates the program did not terminate quite the way we wanted to or didn't execute quite the way we wanted to. So therefore, we terminated it. So very often, the convention is to invoke the exit method and pass a negative number as the return code or the response code. And this is an indication that things didn't go quite so well. The second option in the catch block would be to handle the condition, but then allow the program to continue execution beyond the point at which the exception was handled, that is beyond the catch block. And there are reasons that we might want to do this. First, let's take a look at a little bit of a review of this first situation by looking at a program I have called File Read Demo. In this case, we are going to be reading a file and processing the data within this file. This is a text file. But the key here of where the exception can arise is we first have to open the file. We've got to find it and then open it. So we're allowing the user to interact with the program and supply the name of the file. When the user enters the name, we take that name and then go looking for that file, attempt to open it. So let's take a closer look at the code that we have here. We're creating a scanner object because we wish to read from the keyboard. This is going to allow the user to respond to our prompt when we ask them to enter the name of the file. We then put a prompt out that says enter the file name and we invoke the next line method for this scanner object and read whatever string they've entered. This will then be assumed to be the name of the file. So we create our scanner object and then we're going to be using file input string. So what we do here is include the call to the constructor for file input stream within a try block. This is potentially where an exception can be thrown because this is where the file is going to be opened and made available to the application. So when we call file input stream, we're going to be providing the name of the file, the, the string provided by the user. And if we find that file, file input stream object will be created and the connection is made, the file is open, and we're in good shape. Of course, in such a situation, we skip over the catch block. But in the event that we do not find the file for the name that the user supplied, the exception that will be thrown would be file not found exception. That's where we have the associated catch block here to deal with that very specific situation. And our choice of action here is to simply notify the user, putting out a message that the file was not found, and then exiting the program. Here I've chosen to use a zero, but as I said, more appropriately, a negative number would be a better response. 
And this means the program just terminates right then and there. Even though I have additional instructions that follow the try catch block, none of these would be given the opportunity to execute in the event that the file was not found. So let's take a look at this. I've got a file called sample input text and observe that there are four lines of input here. This is going to be the source of input for our simple execution. So let me go back to the program. We will compile the code and then run it. And as I run it, it prompts me for the file name. So I'm going to enter sample input.txt and the call to the file input stream constructor was successful. The catch block did not execute because no exception was thrown. So we jump down past the catch block and we go ahead and create a scanner object to work with the file. And then we have a loop to walk through the file line by line. Let's run it one more time. But this time what we'll do is supply a file name that doesn't exist in this particular area. So I enter a file name. The file was not found. So what happened in this execution was the exception was thrown within the try block when we invoked the constructor for the file input stream. The exception happened to be file not found exception. We dealt with it by printing out this message and then the program terminated. So that's one way of using a try catch. We respond to the exception that we've caught by simply terminating the program. So here we provide a quick summary of what we just looked at. In the try block, we have a call to a constructor that potentially can cause an exception to be thrown. If the name of the file cannot be found, then this constructor throws the exception and that's the end of the try block. What happens is control will be passed into the catch component and given that the exception is actually file not found exception, the exception is handled. And then we take, print out a message and terminate the program. And once again, the code we just looked at is contained within a file called filereaddemo.java. Let's discuss the other situation that we mentioned. Suppose the exception is thrown and there's a way that the program could continue executing. We can recover from that situation. Here, it's the same exception situation. The try block is again attempting to open the file by invoking the file input stream constructor. Should the exception be raised, file not found exception, all we're doing in this case is notifying the user, but we have removed the call to system exit. So the exit method does not invoke, which means that once this message has been displayed, execution continues down here immediately following the try catch statement. We illustrate how this could work within the file called file read demo 2.java. Okay, the change that we've made to the program in this version called file read demo 2 is to include within the try block an additional operation. We assign a value to this switch or this indicator file not ready and what we've also done is remove the system exit so let's explain exactly what this is doing here back up to the top and review all of the code here we are again propping the user so we need a scanner object we get the file name after we get the file name what we do is attempt to open the file if it's successful then we are able to execute this second instruction that follows the call to the constructor. If it's not successful, the exception is thrown and the statement that I've highlighted here, assigning to file not ready a value of false, will not be given the opportunity to execute. We will jump right into the catch block. But if it is successful, then we skip over the catch block and proceed to execute instructions down here around line 42 or so. Let's look at how I've coded this. I've coded it with a do while. So this Boolean indicator of file not ready is going to be used to control the processing of the do while. Within the do block, what we do is we prompt the user. This will be the initial prompt, give me the name of the file. Then within the try block, we attempt to open the file. 
If opening the file is successful, then we turn our switch from the initial value of true to a setting of false. This is the switch or indicator that's going to be used to control processing. So initially it's true, but we change it to false if we were successful in opening the file. Now, assuming we're successful, the catch block doesn't execute. We hit the end of the loop, and what happens? We do the test. File not ready will have been assigned true initially, but it got changed to false if the file was opened. Therefore, the while condition is no, no longer true, so we fall through. But if the catch block did execute, file not ready would retain its value of true, and that would cause us to go back up to the top and do another iteration of the loop. So given that we fall through, that means the file is open. We go ahead and then work our way through the content of the file with a while loop. Take a look at this in action. Fire it up, and we'll enter the file that we worked with before, which is sample input.txt, and we get all of that output. And again, no exception was thrown. Try it one more time, and this time we'll enter a bad file name. And what happens here is we get an opportunity to enter it again. Enter another bad file name. It continues again until finally we give it a valid file name. So the do while is the loop structure that we chose here to do the processing with the try catch block. Let's explain why. What we did because of a do while was a post test. So what this means is we are forcing the program to execute the body of the loop one time. And if we're successful, then we fall through. But if it's not successful, then we go back up. But the reason we chose the post test is we wanted to have that initial try operation, which prompted the user for the name. And in addition to prompting the user for the name, we attempted to open the file. So that's the key here, that the, the initial attempt not only opened the file, but was preceded by the prompt to the user to get the name. So we have to do this at least once. So that's our choice of a post-test loop where we're doing a do while. In the actual application code that processed the data, we chose to use a while. With the while loop, what we have is we're saying now that we've opened the file, as long as we have data, and what we're doing is we're using the has next method to confirm that we are pointing to something other than the end of file indicator, but there's actually data there, data that has not yet been read or brought into the program. So as long as we have something, we're going to read the data, and then we're going to process it, and then provided we still have data, we'll repeat that process. But at some point, when we've read the last line and we advance to point to nothing, that will cause has next to say false because, hey, I'm not pointing to anything. There's no more. And then we'll fall through and close the file. Let's show this in action. Uh, what I want to do is I want to modify the program a little bit. And this one is called File Read Demo 3. The slight modification will show you why we wanted a while loop and just how that works. So what I've done is uh, after the file has been opened, we fall through and I create a counter. The counter is going to be used to count the number of records processed or the number of lines processed from the input file. So, of course, we initialize it to zero because even though the file has been opened, we've not yet brought anything in. We've not performed any input or read operation. So now we go ahead and say, provided there is data, go ahead and bring it in, process it, and increment the counter. Then do that over and over and over such that the counter will be incremented once for each row or line of text processed. And then we display in the end how many records or rows we processed. 
So let's fire this up. And we'll use our good old sample input, which we know has some data. And the final line of output use that counter that we incremented. And it tells us we had four lines. Now, let's fire it up one more time and use a non-existent file. Again, the exception was thrown. So none of that new code came into play. So how do we test the new code? Well, the new code says there has to be a file, so it can't be a non-existent file, but the file must be empty. So let me go ahead and create another file, which is empty. And I'll even use that clever name of empty, empty.txt. Notice there's nothing in there. So now what I'm going to do is run the program one more time, and this is going to be my input file. So now we give it empty.txt, and notice it says zero lines. Now, the zero is coming from the value of the variable called how many. And of course, how many was initialized to zero, which means that the only place it gets incremented is within the body of the loop. We never got into the body of the loop. So this condition evaluated to false after the file was open and we performed our initial read. Therefore, this is a pretest. So this precondition or this pretest uh, loop is being utilized here because we don't want to enter the body if we don't have any data. So we showed some interesting stuff here. The difference between the the post test and the pre test, and different situations where one might be more appropriate than the other. So let's summarize what we just talked about. We explained two options for designing and implementing a catch block. One would simply say we intercept the problem and then terminate the program. We can't, we either can't continue or choose not to continue. The second is we intercept the problem, handle it in some way but then allow the program to continue execution beyond the point of where we executed the exception handler. We discussed the use of the try-catch statement in this context for input validation. Uh, the idea was we were trying to get a valid file name from the user. And once we obtained that, then we were able to continue. But we gave the user multiple opportunities to enter a valid file name. We then explained the two types of loops that we were able to utilize and the appropriateness of one versus the other in the different contexts. For example, with the try catch, we said, well, we've got to do this thing, this try section, at least one time, so a do while made sense. And then in the second situation, once we had the file open, we didn't know if we had any data until we attempted to read from it. But we don't want to read and try to process if we don't have any data. So what we need to do is find out, is there anything in there? If there's nothing in there, then we don't want to do any of that processing. So that's where we kind of did a pretest, and we used a while loop for that. So the examples that I used can be found on the accompanying website, and hopefully you'll find this to be a useful explanation of the try-catch block with the context of input validation and the points that I've mentioned here. So if you found the video useful, feel free to offer some comments and perhaps consider subscribing to the channel so you're notified when we add new videos. And once again, thanks for watching.